Hey guys, welcome back to the Blue Podcast. Today, as you can see, I'm joined by Nick and we are very excited to present to you the very brand new Red and White show. Uh, we've, this has been in the pipeline for a while now. Nick and I have uh, discussed it and um, yeah, we're really excited to bring it to you. It's obviously, I mean, you know Nick and I, you know Nick from the previous show that we did um, and we're both Forest fans. So this, is, this show is definitely going to have uh, sort of like a forest centre to it, but obviously still going to be uh, talking about the like having discussion on the general Premier League as well, and uh, also FPL because we're both big into FPL this season, and so that's going to be another one of the focus of these shows. Uh, we don't know how regularly regularly they're going to occur, but um, probably at least at least every couple of weeks, if not if not more regularly than that. Um, but yeah, Nick, how are you doing today, mate? Yes, I'm very well, thank you. Um, suffering from a bit of um, international um, friendly itis because um, can't do with all these friendlies or at least glorified friendlies in the nations league. So I just can't wait for the club football to be back. Oh, I couldn't agree more, mate. And I mean, I'm guessing you saw the England result last night, but uh, that was so appalling that I think, yeah, even worse than how Forest have been performing recently. <laughs> that's that's quite a stretch as well, yes. isn't it? Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, we might as well touch on that now. Do you think Southgate's past his best? Like, what um, is he finished? I mean, we're now relegated to the second division of the Nations League. Well, the question was, is he past his best? But I question, when was his best? Because was his best getting relegated in Middlesbrough in the Premier League? Or is it now getting relegated in England? So I just don't <laughs> think he's a very good manager in, uh, all in all, to be honest. I think England deserve a better manager with this sort of so-called golden generation that we have. I think we could go places if the right managers brought in. I mean, I know Forest fans wouldn't like this, but I think Steve Cooper, I mean, after Graham Potter going to Chelsea, I think Steve Cooper's probably the next best thing. And he's, I think he would certainly do wonders with the England job. So um, I think anyone but Southgate really with uh, a track record of young, nice, exciting football, maybe uh, success with um, the younger players because, as you can see on our England team at the minute, it's just full of these young players. Um, so yeah, uh, anyone, anyone but Southgate, really. Yeah, no, I think you, uh, I think you made an excellent point there about uh, Steve Cooper taking over. I just think I saw a tweet the other day, and it was like Southgate wouldn't manage a single team in the Premier League. He wouldn't get no. a job as a Premier League manager, and no. for that to be the head coach of England, a team that's one of the favourites to win the World Cup, I just think that's. Um, it's just not a great situation to be in, just as an English football fan in general. So, yeah. He's there for uh, his uh, political correctness, isn't he? That's why. He's, he's there, there because he's good in interviews. That's the yeah. only reason he's there. Uh, the only one I can think of, anyway. Yeah, I think that is the only reason. And yeah. maybe his, his history playing for England, etc., etc. But, yeah, he's not the man, is he? No, definitely not. I mean, you say history playing with England, but you wouldn't give Peter Crouch a job, would you? As the no, you wouldn't. So, no. Yeah. There's a. Uh, he was hired based on a very loose print, very loose principles anyway, in the fact that he can communicate nicely and he did play for England before. But yeah, he's um, certainly underqualified and he's done nothing to uh, nothing to sort of rectify that in the last few matches anyway. Um, well, look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have much uh, trust in the FA considering who they've appointed in recent times or even stretching back to um, the lack of an appointment of Brian Clough in, the, in his heyday. So... Um, and then you look at the recent managers, Sam Allardyce, um, Roy Hodgson. Roy Hodgson, yeah. Fabio Capello was probably quite a popular choice, but that didn't work out, obviously. So um, I wouldn't have any trust in the FA to make a correct appointment next. So um, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. And I mean, even even Eddie Howe has been picked for it before. We just kind of yeah. need a, a young British manager to come in. I think that's the general consensus that everybody agrees is the best way to the best way to go forward from now. But um, anyway, we're here today to talk about Nottingham Forest. So I think we'd best dive straight into that. You touched on Steve Cooper there, yeah. uh, saying that Nottingham Forest fans wouldn't necessarily, well, obviously wouldn't be happy to hear him being touted for the England job. But um, I mean, we've not had the best start to the season ourselves. Um, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, we saw at the weekend, we lost 3-2 to Fulham at home. Another time we've absolutely bottled a, um, a first half lead. Um, go on, what do you have to say about that? Look, I think everyone was saying, I mean, all the media and everything, when we made all these signings, that um, a slow start was perhaps inevitable. And um, I think despite our allegiances, I think we probably saw it coming as well. Um, so I don't think it comes as a great shock that we started slowly. But I see week on week, obviously, the last two results have been particularly disappointing. But in the month of August, I saw a progression through every game. 
the team was starting to gel a lot more. So um, I've still got faith. and I think we will improve. I just think it's taking a bit of time to gel. I think recent capitulations, second half particularly, um, it's probably just down to a lack of trust within the teammates. They probably don't trust one another as well as maybe other teams do. And when it's sort of, when the S word hits the fan, um, it probably gets, I don't know, I think that's maybe where we start to capitulate, where they don't have full trust and they start to worry a bit. And then, obviously, players do silly things. And, yeah, I think that's probably what the recent capitulations are down to. Um, we'd like to think they'd get ironed out in the future, obviously, with the players getting to know each other, particularly the past sort of three or four weeks. We've not really played much football. We've only had one game because of, obviously, the Queen's death and now the international break. Hopefully, we've had plenty of time on the training pitch, getting to know them each, um, getting... Uh, players to know each one another um, yeah and I'm just hoping after now we've got Leicester I mean at the minute is there any more is there much more of a winnable game than Leicester at the minute so yeah they are bottom bottom of the league with zero wins so far so and East Midlands derby you think our players would be up for it yeah uh, yeah I guess we'll wait and see but I, I think we have to touch on Steve Cooper because obviously you've had, with both that knowledge, it's not been a good start to the season. Um, maybe a realistic start if we were being slightly pessimistic at the beginning. Um, but Steve Cooper, some of his decisions are still questionable in my in my mind. I mean, let's touch on the Fulham game because bringing Sam Surridge off the bench rather than Emmanuel Dennis, who we paid £20 million pounds for, um, was mind mind blowing to me. I I don't know why we did that. I don't know why we're not starting Lewis O'Brien. Um, I don't know why we're starting Ryan Yates. I know you have slightly more of a favourable opinion towards Ryan Yates than I do. Um, but I I don't I I see so many poor decisions in going into the the starting eleven and the substitutes there. Um, can you see where he's coming from, or or do you agree with me? I think this all just goes down to not knowing his best team yet. Um, I'm not a big fan of Sam Surridge. And obviously, you go back to the Bournemouth game and we I think it was 2-2 when we brought on Jack Cole back, which isn't a particularly inspiring substitution either. Um, those sort of substitutions, I, I don't really have any... Um, I, I, I don't know where they come from, but um, the Emmanuel Dennis thing, I'm not sure if he was a Steve Cooper signing or whether he was a club signing because... Um, he obviously doesn't fancy him much. And previously, I don't know where he played for before Watford, but apparently he was a winger before that and sort of got put into a striker position for Watford. Um, so I'm not sure if he's the out-and-out -out striker we think he is. Um, so maybe Sam Surridge is the sort of more traditional number nine that we're looking to bring off the bench. Just, I mean, Cooper's obviously a big fan of him. Worked with him before at uh, Swansea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um but yeah, I think I think with the Sam Surridge substitution in particular, it's probably more tried and tested what he knows rather than sort of an unknown. Maybe a player doesn't quite trust in Emmanuel Dennis. Um, so I wouldn't be too worried about the, the substitutions. I think he's still trying to find his feet in the Premier League, trying to f figure out what his best team was. Obviously, last year when he came in, it was pretty obvious within a few games who his best team was. And we settled down on that pretty much for the whole season. Um, but he's not got sort of the same stability probably the wrong word but um this season so far but like i said if we just stick with steve cooper i think with a bit more time uh with a bit more gelling i think i think things will come good or well, relatively good as they can in the premier league because it's a, it's a brutal division yeah yeah no i think that was uh nicely put so i'm guessing you think we'll avoid relegation in the end then despite being 19th at the moment um look i'm I probably am a little bit less confident than I was at the start of the season, but um, I, I still think we've got enough. But it's just, you look at the division this year and you just compare, like, who are our relegation candidates. Fulham and Bournemouth, Fulham in particular, have gone off to a flyer. Bournemouth have started pretty well. But like we said, I think Bournemouth will be down at the end of the season. Leicester, how long will Leicester remain around the bottom? Will they get a new manager and then will their fortunes change? Um and you look, West Ham aren't going to stay down there. And all, all our relegation rivals you'd have on paper, at least at the start of the season, they're all doing a lot better than us. So um, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Um, if I was to predict now, I'd probably say... I'd probably say we'd stay up, but only just. It's just, you know, um, Bournemouth, I, I refer back to the word stability, Bournemouth have come up a lot more stable. They've not made too many signings. Um, Fulham already had almost a Premier League ready 
uh, squad anyway, and they've just sort of added on top of that with the the previous squad to fall back onto. Um, so I think we do have the ability to finish above at least those two sides, plus maybe a surprise package in a Leicester or a Southampton or an Everton, whoever else will be down there. Um, so yeah, you got to keep the faith, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, you have to. I think I think you made a good point there about. West Ham and Leicester, the chances are they're really not going to stay in the relegation zone for that much longer. Um, bearing in mind the quality they've got in the side, the fact that their boards will sack their managers at even a sniff of relegation. So I think Moyes and Rogers are on their last legs if, if things don't turn around. Um, obviously, we've got the next day for Nottingham Forest is Leicester uh, on Monday. Do you think, say we lose that game, do you, like, do you still believe we'll... Um, will avoid relegation then, or do you think um, us losing the game, Leicester jumping above us, maybe West Ham even win, and suddenly we're three points adrift at the bottom? Do you think? Um, oh, sorry, we'll be at the bottom on goal difference to Leicester, but um, do you think that's maybe curtains for the season, or is it far too early to call? It would too say this part of the season, but um, in the heat of the moment, if I if you were talking to me straight after the game, I would probably be very uh, pessimistic about our chances this season, but. If you look at the bigger picture, you might look at the end of the season and think Leicester away. I know we're obviously catching them at a good time, but Leicester away normally is probably quite a difficult place to go to. But it's, it's difficult at the minute because we don't know whether their fortunes will change. We don't know where they'll be at the end of the season. Obviously, they're on a bit of a downward curve. Um, if we got a bad result, if we'd have lost by more than one goal, I would, I would be very pessimistic about our chances. But um, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. It's still very early doors. Uh, my opinions haven't changed too much of our, our season so far. Obviously, the recent results have been disappointing, but Leicester shapes up to be a huge game early on in the season, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm just curious, by the way, because obviously I think a lot of the Forest fan base have been criticising Brennan Johnson in particular for sort of the lack of physicality, lack of desire, for want of a better word, on the pitch. Do you think he starts against Leicester or is it time to bring in um, Emmanuel Dennis? or even play with a one year Lingard and Morgan Gibbs White? Well, we spoke about Cooper not really having a clue what his best team is. I don't have a clue what my best team is. I've tried to make a few teams on my phone, and I'm thinking, what formation do we play? Do we need to change from a five to a four to the back? Um, how do we fit in Lingard and Gibbs White? Because regardless of what people say about Lingard, I think he probably is still one of my best players, even though he's been a bit quiet. Maybe he's not been as good as people expect him to, but... You see the quality he's got with the, the setting up of Lewis O'Brien's goal for our second against Fulham. Um, I still would like to incorporate him in our starting eleven, but also Morgan Gibbs White looks a really good player and probably is our best player at the minute. Um, and then who do you play up top? You know, our knee's not been too um, impressive in my eyes, at least. Um, Dennis, like I said, I'm not sure he's an out and out number nine. So could you really play him by himself if you've got two attacking midfielders behind him? I think you'd have to play Dennis plus another traditional number nine, so an Awini or Sam Surridge, but we won't get on to that because I don't think Sam Surridge will be starting in the Premier League. Um, you'd hope not, I think, anyway. I think yeah. we're missing... I, I, was shouting, I was calling out for Keenan Davis at the start of the season. I'm, I still think we're missing a Keenan Davis. A big man who the ball just sticks to. Awini is a big guy, but the ball just doesn't seem to stick to him. He's got a touch of a donkey. <laughs> um, he's more of a poacher rather than a Keenan Davis sort of powerhouse. Where, and that's where I think Johnson probably had his joy last season, just playing off Keane Davis, where Keane Davis, was, the ball would stick to him and Johnson would just run off him. Um, so to answer your question, I probably would stick with Brennan Johnson, but don't ask me about the formation we'll play, because I think I've not a clue whether we'll stick to what helps out last season with a five at the back or whether we'll revert to four at the back. Um, and then another issue we have at the four at the back is from the impressions I've had early on is our obviously our two wing backs are very attacking. And with a lack of pace in our centre backs, we might struggle if um they might be left vulnerable at the back. We've got two at the back with sort of Scott McKenna or Joe Warrell who uh, lack a bit of pace. So that's why I can't get my head round. Um I think we could probably go four at the back if we've got Nia Carte and a that Loic Barde or a or a even a Willie Bolly next to Nia Carte just with a bit of experience. Um so, yeah, in the minute, I'd probably stick with a five at the back just because there's a few question marks over our centre-back positions. And uh, I think we need all the help we can get in the minute. But then you move further forward up the pitch, obviously taking one further back to add to the five at the back. How do we incorporate all these players into attack? 
And also, our midfield's a bit worried at the minute because you've got Lewis O'Brien and Mangala. I saw a stat about Mangala. He's only made four tackles in his three appearances this season. So, although the eye test may suggest that he's a bit more physical, the stats don't. Um, him and O'Brien are pretty box-to-box, box, but then, again, you leave your vulnerable defence, sort of maybe a four-on-three or whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's my, that's my thought process. I'm not a clue what we're going to do. Um, yeah, yeah. Cooper's um, Cooper's seemed to favour the five back, and he's stuck with it for pretty much the last six months. I think you pointed out the last time he went with the back four was the Liverpool game, um, and obviously we played pretty well in that game, but it didn't seem to stick for whatever reason, and we continued with the five back. Um, but I know you were a massive advocate of playing three in midfield, especially just like you say with the items we're being overrun a lot in all of the games we have played so far this season. So I think it is essential to get the three in midfield at some point. Um, and yeah, like you, I'm a big fan of Jesse Lingard and Gibbs White playing together. Yeah. I know Lingard hasn't been massively impressive so far, but I just think that he has the quality and Jesse yeah. Lingard doesn't get like Jesse Lingard, Renan Rodney, and Dean Henderson don't get relegated. They're yeah. not a team with those three players in does not get relegated realistically. Yeah. Like if we're looking Look, at, yeah, go on. On. so I'll just so if we're looking at our best 11 or 11 that we'll think we'll play against Leicester, um. Okay, let's go for our best 11, minusing the injuries. I think I'll probably have a back three of Nia Carte, McKenna in the middle, just to get a bit of um, sheltering from sort of the, the wingers that will run laps around him at the minute. And then like a, a Willie Bolly or I don't really like Warrell on the right, but maybe... I was um, so maybe... unimpressed with Bolly though. I'd, I'd even go Warrell over uh, over Bolly. Bolly did not... He stuck out like a sore thumb to me in the Fulham game. He's just more of a physical presence than Warren. I think he's a bit more experienced to rely on. Um, I think I'd probably go Willie Bolly over Warren in the right centre back role. And obviously, you've got Gene Henson at the goal and Renan Lodi and um, Nico Williams in the, the wing backs. So we've got six players to play with. And like I said, there was a, I saw a quote from, I can't remember what, it was an experienced public manager, it might have been a Sean Dyche or something, saying, You have to play three in the midfield, otherwise, you just get overrun in midfield. And we found that out so far was getting so exposed. Um, so I think if you play four at the back, you play Kuyate in a defensive midfield role. If you're playing five at the back, you're going to have to play a midfield three of probably Yates, Mangala and um, O'Brien in, in the three. And then you've got, how many have you got left? Just two up top then. Two if up you top. Play, if you play five back, those three, yeah. Yeah. And then and probably Brennan Johnson on the counter-attack. Again, like, there's so many headaches that the manager's got to deal with. Um I genuinely don't know what to do. Last season, like I said, it was it was so easy just to yeah. predict the eleven. You go, blah, 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 blah. yeah, that's easy. But now, I don't know if it's the amount of options we got that's causing this headache, or whether it's just um, the type of profiles we got in there that possibly don't fit our formations. Um, so yeah, that's my thought process, and I don't have a clue what we can do. What What are you thinking? For your best well, eleven. I um, similar to you in that I think Cooper's not going to divert from a back five, not at the moment anyway, so I think that's the best way to go about it. Um, I, th I think one of the main problems is that in our formation, we need a player like Ryan Yates, and Ryan Yates was perfect for the championship because I, yeah. think, I think his level is the championship. Like A big six-foot-three, box-to-box, -box, can score with his head, can score a couple long-range goals, defends well, works hard. I think he's perfect in that it's a Ryan Yates role, but we just need yeah. somebody with more quality. Like it's he has all the physical attributes for that role and all the desire and stuff, but I just think his end product isn't there. And it like just having a box to box in that same position would be so much better. But like you say, we don't have that. So it's also it's, the physicality as well. When you see he's gonna be stood in my best eleven, he's stood next to Mangala and O'Brien, who are probably five ten or or lower than that. So he needs someone in there who adds a bit of a physical presence, gonna win some second balls in midfield. Um so you've got to be looking at Kuyate or um, or Yates. But Kuyate, you don't want him when you've got a back five already because that's just neg that's Southgate tactics, that is. You don't, want, you don't want a defensive midfielder plus five at the back. Um, so that's the sort of headaches I'm having. Um, who would you play up top then? If you're playing if you're playing three midfield and five at the back, who would you have as a two? <sighs> it's it's tricky. We're likely, one, actually, because we're you likely going to be playing counter-attacking football if we've got basically eight midfielders and defenders and goalkeepers. So... You probably have to sit back and hit them with pace on the counter. Well, if you go from that perspective, then two, then I'd say there's three options for your two up top, and it's between Dennis, Gibbs, White, and Johnson. 
that's that's your can that's that's your you defend with eight men and you counter attack with the two up top. Like yeah. that's 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 your only options because a one you is not going to do that job. And no. like you say, he's not Keenan Davis. The ball's not going to stick to him if it's punted up. So if the ball's punted up, he's not going to relieve any pressure whatsoever. He's yeah. not the go-to person. But don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating for our tactic being just sit back, hoof ball, and hope hope uh, hope we score on the counter attack because I think we'll get relegated that way. Um, I genuinely think swapping to a back four is the best option, but I just don't think Cooper will do it. So I'm going to base. I'll, I'll I'll say my team now, but I'm going to base it off the fact that Cooper won't swap to a back four. Um, so I just think that Nia Carte definitely has to be in there, obviously. Yeah. Um, I still think Worrell has something to offer at this level, but I'd love to see Loic Bade instead. But obviously, we've barely seen anything of him, so we don't really we haven't know. Haven't seen anything of him. Yeah. Yeah, we we don't know what his ability is like or what his level is. Uh, yeah. By all accounts, he's got every attribute like to be a good Premier League defender, but we just haven't seen it yet. Um, and then McKenna, I think, has to be a left centre back. If if not, Kuyate at centre centre back, Nikate at left centre back, and then Worrell or Bade on the right. Yeah. yeah. So I think Kuyate played centre back Palace for many years, so I think he can definitely do a job there. And as we know, he's got the height and the presence, so he'd be a great addition. I think. I, I think if we want to stand a real, this is the thing because I don't want to play two up top with three midfielders. But again, we're getting overrun in the midfield. I'd, I think I'd still stick with the midfield too, and I'd go Lewis O'Brien and Mangala because the games that we've played with those two, um, we beat West Ham, and I know West Ham those points. Yeah, yeah, we beat we West Ham. We get points for those two midfield. Yeah, exactly right. And whilst so I think sense. yeah, it wasn't the best of opposition at the time. Um, that's where we've been successful so far. And in that game, we had uh, we didn't have Morgan Gibbs-White. And I think, like you say, Morgan Gibbs-White is probably our best player. So yeah. I think having him sat in front of the two with his work rate coming back and helping out could be extremely effective. And then either a Wan Yi and Dennis slash Johnson up top or Gibbs-White and Lingard with Dennis up top by himself. I know what you're saying about Dennis not being out and out number nine, but I watched him so much at Watford last season because obviously I had him on my fantasy team like a yeah. lot. And he is genuine quality. Like he's he's our best attacker in my opinion, like our best striker. Okay, interested. Yeah, I I don't have a clue. Um, well, I'll see what he's got. There's so many players. Yeah, there is. I suppose it's a good um, problem it's, to have, but it's actually right. working against Cooper at the minute because he doesn't have a clue what his best team is or what formation he wants to play. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, neither of, us, neither of us there mentioned Remo Freuler. And Remo yes. Freuler was captain of a Champions League side, Atalanta. Yeah. Like, how is he not in... Like, this should be a happy headache, but it's not. Like, with second bottom, it's not a happy headache. Coop hasn't yeah. found his 11 yet, and that's problematic. It is. But, like I said, it was inevitable, um, judging by 22 signs we've made, and some of them fairly recently, you know, at the end of August. So, um, yeah, we've got a bit of time on the training field. Hopefully, we'll... Uh, Iron some of those um, mistakes out that are probably made or brought on by not knowing each other. Um, we'll have to see, won't we? Yeah, yeah. And it'll be interesting to, uh, obviously, we're both going to look forward to and watch every single game. Um, yes. I know you'll be going home and away to as many as you can. So, yeah, it'll be very interesting to um, see what the future holds for, for Forrest this season. And hopefully yeah. we stay up. Um, but I think, yeah, we'll... Um, We'll touch on FPL a bit now because I know me and you are very excited to talk about this. We've got yeah. very different opinions about one player in particular. I know, and uh, <laughs> so I'll sort of I'll, I'll allude to that now um, by asking you. We've had I think eight game weeks so far, or it might be nine game weeks. Are there any players going forward that are that you consider undroppable? They would never leave your squad. Well, look, there's a player that I know isn't in your team, but I honestly don't know how because he's the greatest goal scorer we've seen in the Premier League, Erling Haaland. He's scoring almost every game, or he has done it bar one against Bournemouth, where I ironically uh, triple captain him. But um, yeah, he's he's undroppable. You cannot leave him out of your team. He's scoring every week in the free float in Man City team. You can't leave him out. Um, is there any others? I think there's a few sort of the goalkeepers. There's a few um, few players to keep in there. Like your Nick Pope's probably quite a good idea to keep in there, just because. Newcastle are fairly resolute at the back and also Nick Pope's a great goalkeeper. But um, he's not one that I would say is undroppable at all because there's plenty of options. You know, you've got Edison, etc. Allison, maybe not Allison in a minute, but further on in the season, I think Allison would be a good option, etc. etc. There's plenty of goalkeepers. Um, 
strikers, I think you've got to play front three because there's just so many strikers um, on fire at the minute. You've got Mitrovic, Tony, you've obviously got Haaland, you've got Kane. There's so many different options and I think you do have to play at least three of those four in your team. Otherwise, you're going to fall down the bottom of the table. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you say that if you don't have one of those in your team, you'll fall to the bottom of the table. I only have one of those and it's Harry Kane. I, I transferred out Tony literally last week and I don't have Erling Haaland. And I know we've discussed this before and you've, um, let's say, taken the mick out of me for not having Erling Haaland. Um, but I've been doing fairly successfully despite not owning him for a single uh, game so far this season. And from my point of view, it's too late to own him now. He's already hit all. He's already hit the majority of the points, I think. Um, Pep Guardiola said that he's not going to be playing week in, week out. We know he's slightly injury prone. We know that Pep likes to, well, play Pep roulette and just stick in random players and completely take players by surprise. Um, and I just think with 81% of the game owning Erling Haaland, if, so if he scores, yeah, my, my rank will decrease and everybody will be doing well. But if you own him, you have to captain him. Because if you own him and he scores and uh, you don't, you haven't captained him, your rank is still decreasing because yeah. half the people that own him will captain him. And more than half, probably. Probably more than half, right? Especially depending yeah. on the opponent. Um, and I just think that if if Erling Haaland doesn't score, because obviously the chance are he will score, blah, 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 blah. But that if he doesn't, my rank, that will be more important than any single one of my players doing well. Because the entire game owns Erling Haaland. But you can say that, Tom, but he's he's only blanked in one game, and even then he got an assist in it. So yeah, he's not blanked. He's, I he's know not what blanked you're saying, yet. You talk about Pep Roulette as well. Um, Haaland has been the one mainstay. Him and probably Canso and Edison have, uh, have been the, the three mainstays in the City team. I mean, obviously De Bruyne got dropped against Forest. There's there's players that Pep regards as droppable, and then you've got Erling Haaland, Cancelo, and um, Edison where they, they will not be dropped unless injury or... Obviously, you've got a bit of fixture congestion coming up with the, the more of the Champions League rounds and the, the you've got the League Cup coming up and obviously the FA Cup later on in the season. You've got fixture congestion, but early on, the signs are, unless Haaland's injured or um, maybe got a three-game week and with two of them being more important than the other, then I think Haaland's going to be in there pretty much all the time. I know, and you make a good point because that has been the case so far. But I just feel like since I've missed out on that, I know that the minute I get him, that will change. And I'm just banking on the fact that this isn't sustainable. The law of averages says that Erling Haaland is not going to score 60 goals this season. Like, he's not. Going he's to. robotic, Tom. He's robotic. He's not human. Pep Guardiola is so unpredictable. Erling Haaland could, be score, could score five goals one game, and the next game he's dropped. Not only just dropped, but he's dropped for three weeks. Just that's that can happen with Pep Guardiola. Well, my viewpoint with, okay. my on, view point with Haaland is I've sort of gone for the uh, the squad tactic where you've got players off the bench if your players don't play. Um, and there's been, there's quite a few good cheap options at the minute. Um, so I've got a bench full of players that are ready to go if Pep does drop a Haaland. I know obviously if he brings them off the bench and you know, he gets one point, then it's it's a bit of a nightmare. But um, I've got players off the bench who can come in and and hopefully get a few points themselves. Um, that's a risky take with any City player, but you do have to have three City players in your team because uh, they score so many goals and obviously don't concede too many either. I think you do have to play three City players and take a bit of a risk. Otherwise, you're going you're gonna to fall behind. Yeah, I, I know. And I know you're right. This is the thing. Because not owning three City players is is suicide, essentially, because most, I think most people tend to go for a double City defence because they are the best, they have been the best defence in the league for the last five years. Yeah. Um, and then one of, like, like last year, it was it was De Bruyne or Sterling, or this year it will be De Bruyne or, uh, or Haaland, or in, mo in a lot of cases, actually. Blue. But I just think because even De Bruyne's a risk of being dropped. Like, how can Kevin De Bruyne be at risk of being dropped? And yet he's 12 million. How can you justify having that in your team? It's, it's a tough one, especially with, like, Foden, Mahrez, Gundogan. All these dip, Bernardo Silva, Grealish, excuse me, all these different players, even Alvarez could come in and play. Um, it's really tough to own Man City players and not be nervous by the time the team news is released. The difference between De Bruyne and Haaland is obviously De Bruyne, there's plenty of alternatives for uh, Pep to pick and sort of like a, I don't know what formation they play, but 
two or three attacking midfielders behind the main striker. The genuine number nines have only got Julian Alvarez, who um, is a completely different player to Haaland. And obviously, it's working out for Haaland at the minute. So, why would you change the sort of n- number nine you've got in there? Um, Alvarez is bagged, is it bagged three, is it? Just off bench appearances. Something like that, something like but I don't that, yeah. think I don't think Pep would drop him intentionally unless there is something wrong with Haaland. So, whereas De Bruyne, you've got all these sort of players that you can drop, you change formations, you can play the players. Um, so yeah, De Bruyne's definitely a lot more droppable than Haaland is. That, yeah, that I, explains I, why. I would agree with that entirely. Yeah, I mean, I, this, this is the thing. All your points are like logical. It, I'm the one that's like sort of breaking the mold by not going Haaland because it's seemingly stupid not to have him because he scores every week so far. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm ten points above you, so <laughs> I guess he, he's uh, he's really right. I mean, we'll, we'll see come the end of the season, but. Um, yeah, it is a very interesting one because obviously Erling Haaland seems to be the main... Well, he is the main man at the moment, not just for fantasy football, but for the Premier League in general. Um, I, I think actually you touched on a couple of players there. Well, you didn't mention names, but I'm guessing the cheap players on your bench are Leon Bailey, maybe Andreas Pereira. Um, you've probably got one of Emerson, uh, Patterson or Williams for the four mil defenders on your bench. Yeah, um, regardless of how Forrest are doing, Nico Williams is still always a good option. He's only four mil, almost the cheapest player yeah. in the game. Um, and, he, and he plays every week and he will get the odd assist, he'll get the odd goal and he'll also get the odd clean sheet. So he's a player that you can keep on the bench knowing full well if Haaland does drop out. There is a genuine chance of getting quite a few points uh, if you pick the right week, that is. If you pick the right week, and I mean, we say, I mean, Nico Williams' underlying stats make him so good for FPL in theory. Um, but we look at, yeah, we look at the, the good weeks, supposedly. The good weeks would be Bournemouth and Fulham at home. These are literally the easiest two weeks yeah, that you could play a player uh, like Nico Williams. And we've conceded six between the two. But the fact so, of the matter is, yeah. Forrest will keep clean sheets throughout the season. It might it might be against the Man United at Old Trafford, for example. They, they will come. And um, I think that's too good to miss out on, obviously. Even off the bench, I start him quite a lot just because... Me too. I do back him against Bournemouth and Fulham to be fair, which is probably my fault. But um, yeah, he's, he's a player you've got to definitely have in your team. And obviously, Andres Pereira as well. He's been he's been doing well at Fulham. He plays every game. He's only four point five million in midfield, so he's a great option to have as well, even off the bench. Yeah, absolutely spot on. And um, yeah, there are, there's so many really good cheap options this year. No longer are we sort of sat with Eves Basuma on the bench just because he's the only four and a half mil mid that plays. We've we've now got suddenly great options. And um, it's yeah, it's a good year to play, and there's so many non-template teams. Like everybody's breaking the mold this season. You never like that's why there's so much disparity between um, the top players and like the mid-tier players. So yeah, it's, it's a great season, a great season to, uh, to be playing. I know you mentioned before the start of the show one player individual that you're looking at on the way to um, obviously the World Cup's coming up late November, and there's a long string of games before then. There was one player you mentioned you just brought in on the free hit because you're doing a free hit this week, right? That you're looking at for the rest of the uh, World Cup run as well. <laughs> My mind's gone blank. Who was it? James Madison, Nick. James Calm Madison. Off. Perfect. James, James Madison. Madison. I mean, I've brought him in for the free hit because obviously, as you alluded to just a second ago, Forrest, they're a bit susceptible to the odd goal. Um, James, Madison's James Madison's obviously Leicester's key player. So it's perfect for... Um, a free hit to stick Madison in there. I don't know how much he is, six or seven million. Um, it's a bit of a no-brainer, really, to play a free hit and play him against Forrest, where I can imagine, judging by the clubs, the both of the clubs' recent uh, games, you look at Leicester, they've just lost 6-2. Uh, Forrest have conceded six goals in the last two games. I can imagine it's going to be sort of a mental 4-4 or something like that. Oof, um, yeah, that'd be a corker, yeah, wouldn't it? You can see it being that, can't you? Because both there's no problem with the um, both teams' attacks. It's just their defense is letting them down massively. Um, so yeah, I can see. I think I think Forest attackers and Leicester attackers are a very good option this week because, like I said, I think there's been plenty of goals in that game. Yeah, yeah, great shout. And actually, four four is a fantastic prediction because I mean we didn't touch on it at the start of the show, but I, I think a, a great thing to do every week here would be just sort of predict the next Forest game. Yeah, especially yeah, especially because we're doing so terribly at the moment. It's uh, it's kind of hard to predict. I mean, neither of us would have said three two and three two in the Bournemouth and Fulham games. But is that your prediction for Forest Leicester? Then a realistic one. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think if you want, because um, I'll I'll give you mine. I think it would be two one to Forest. I'm going to be optimistic and say we'll do 
Uh, I think we will concede definitely because we can't keep a clean sheet apparently. But I think a little Brennan Johnson double at Leicester, I'd lo- I'd love to see that, especially because he's in my fantasy football team as well. Well, look, if we're not going to be optimistic against bottom of the league, then we're not going to be optimistic against someone. We're not going to predict Forest to beat anyone. So I think I've got to go for like a three-one Forest win. I think. I think. I think we'll. Pro- I think we'll concede, but I think there'll be plenty of goals in the game. But like I said, it could very easily be a three-three or four-four. Yeah, yeah. I think Sky have made a very good decision to put that on Monday Night Football because that is a game well worth watching. Oh, hundred percent. And yeah, I, I just can't wait to see Brennan Johnson up against Daniel Amati and Luke Thomas, who I just pray that he's going to eat them alive. Like, you know, Brennan Johnson can come good. So if he's going to come good against anyone, it has to be that Leicester defence, which is as championship as it gets, really. And I mean, the goalkeeper rock- doesn't feel them much confidence either. You know, our, our reserve goalkeeper, Wayne Hennessy, starts ahead of Danny Ward in goal for Wales. So that's yeah, how mate, poor their goalkeeper is. <laughs> Mate, if Jordan Smith was well, she'd be starting ahead of Danny Ward. Oh my goodness, Ward is one the one of the worst decisions Leicester made was letting Schmeichel go for less than five mil. I think it was not. I agree. Well, they've got Iverson on the bench, who was who was very good at Preston last year. So I think that's a bit of a no brainer. Stick him in instead of Danny Ward, who's obviously had a few issues. Um, about your point about Jordan Smith, I don't think I'd have Jordan Smith over anyone to be honest. I don't know how he wasn't playing in the sideman game today because he is terrible. Yeah, he probably yeah, Calvin Dragon might actually give him a run for his money because yeah, George I think I probably would rather have Calvin Dragon as my third choice goalkeeper. That's a hell of that's a hell of a shout actually. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think Calvin Dragon might bring a few more uh, a bit more excitement to the dressing room than Jordan Smith as well. I don't know how he's on a contract at Nottingham Forest. What what's he what's he done in the last like six years? He's been at the club. He made that fluky save against Ipswich, which kept us up in the last game of the season. But other than that, he cannot kick a ball. I was watching the game today, the side of my game. Carl Dragon's distribution is far better than uh, Jordan Smith's. Um, shot stopping, they're probably about the same, <laughs> which isn't very good. Um, yeah, I think I think they're just rewarding him for his loyalty because they, they gave him a new contract at the start of this season, I think it was, um, which is just bonkers to me. But hopefully we won't ever need him because... Oh, that would probably be one of the worst goalkeeping displays the Premier League's ever seen if he somehow makes it onto the pitch. Genuinely, yeah. I mean, I remember a Cole Darlow one when he first first played for Newcastle in the Premier a few years ago. And I remember watching match of the day and he was torn to shreds. I was like, I, I don't even know how. I think it was um, six million combined when we sold him to the cells. I don't know how we managed to get three million for Cole Darlow because he has been appalling for Newcastle over just like the last five, six years since they've had him. And I, I even think he, yeah, he'd give uh, Jordan Smith a run for his money because, yeah, there's there's no words to describe how bad Jordan Smith actually is. If you're not a Forest <laughs> fan, just you'd rather you'd rather have Cal Dragon goal. I think we've 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 covered that now, but yeah, he is very bad. Yeah, he is. Yeah. I wouldn't want him starting in you know, any any game, League One, League Two game, anyway. Give him, to Darby, give, him, to be fair. give him to Derby. Yeah, I was about Darby. to say that. Yeah. I would. Agent Jordan Smith. Agent Smith, yeah. Agent Smith. <laughs> Brilliant. That's what I'd be doing. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, I think as well, um, we'll just quickly touch on, I think we've chosen West Ham for this week, but we'll touch on a team each each time we do one of these episodes that's around Forest in the league table or at least poses some some sort of threat to either Forest or, in this case, relegation. Um, yeah. We did beat them at the start of the season, very surprisingly. I mean, they did, if we're being honest, kind of dominate us a little bit. But yep. um, they've been very poor. They've only got one win, one draw, and they're in the relegation zone along with us. What's happened? Do you like? I mean, they're playing European football. That's often an excuse, but they played European football last season and they still finished in a great position. So, anything you can sort of point to and go, yeah, that's that's a reason. Are they perhaps suffering from obviously not on a as big a scale as we are, but maybe they made a few signs to splash the cash a little bit this summer. Maybe. Oh. They may be struggling to um, incorporate their new signings into the team. I don't. I'm not sure to be honest with you. Um, they look pretty good against us. They look pretty threatening. Um, ben Rama is a great. He, he had a great performance. He was the one player that I um, pointed out when we played against West Ham. Um, but yeah, I, I think they've been a bit lucky, um, particularly with us. They should have had all three points against us. Declan Rice missed the bounce. They've had a goal disallowed. They've had numerous um, shots over the bar. If you talk about that, like, I mean, we're the same as well, but that puts them on seven points and seven points isn't that bad at the start of the season. Um, I haven't watched all the games, but the result last weekend is not a good one at home, away to Everton. Um, 
good, they say good and some good some parks are a tough place to go but i've been there it's, it's overrated as hell so um that's a bad resort against currently in the table of relegation rival but obviously i don't think it's going to end up that way um but honestly there's not there's not like a there's not an obvious sign as to why they're doing so badly it must i i, I couldn't tell you to be honest with you um I think yeah, it's, it's just, it just happens yeah. in the Premier League. It's brutal, isn't it? It's brutal. Yeah, I mean, players, they'll turn it around. Yeah, we, I mean, it's pretty. Uh, we're both pretty confident they'll turn it around. Um, but it's strange because I mean, we talk about the signings, but you think they've only made players that could possibly be additions. I mean, Skamaka yes. was brought in. I mean, he's been poor so far, if we're being honest. But he was brought in as like a, a, an improvement on Antonio, and we know how well Antonio played last year. So I mean, you got to look at that. Uh, and Maxwell Cornet, who was brilliant for Burnley at times last season, and he's essentially just a bench player to come on and replace one of Fornells, Lanzini, Ben Rama or Bowen. So they've only upgraded their squad and they've not let any of their major players go. I think keeping hold of Bowen and Rice was massive for them. Yeah. So, well, that's there, there's a big factor. Bowen doesn't look the same player as he did last year. I think they probably relied on his goals a bit too heavily last season. Um, Antonio's getting a bit older. He's not quite as prolific he's not shown he's as prolific as he was in the last couple of years um who else is there Declan, Declan Rice has been all right but he's not been he's not been brilliant this year uh their defense looks a bit of a worry when I saw them against Forest they, they look a bit fragile at the back I'm not sure Kurt Zuma's as good as uh people have made him out to be um but yeah yeah I, I'd agree with that and I think maybe maybe even a little thing like losing Mark Noble I know Mark Noble didn't play but yeah. Is, is Declan is Rice that leader in the dressing room that Mark Noble was? Because obviously, whilst Mark Noble barely played, he'd have been in there week in, week out. That's so, a good point you make, actually, because Declan Rice is also the new club captain. Um, is Declan Rice, obviously, he's got great uh, leadership roles, uh, capabilities we can see, but um, has he maybe struggled to sort of fit into the role of club captain? You know, he's got a number, number of responsibilities off the pitch, you know, sorting tickets out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe, maybe he's struggling a little bit with that. I don't know. Maybe because Noble's been there for so long, maybe he's struggling a bit with a lack of a father figure, a bit like Mark Noble. Yeah, genuinely, I think that's. Um, I think that's one that we could definitely point to. At least it's it's the most obvious sort of disparity between last season and this. So, yeah. Um, but like we said, we're pretty sure that West Ham will pick themselves back up and recover. And I'm still. I wouldn't be surprised if, if they finish top half this season. It's a very competitive league. Um, but yeah, top half and definitely a run in Europe would um, would see them have a successful season, I think. Well, look, at the start of the season, you'd have had them around the Newcastles and even the Man United, etc., etc. So um, everyone goes through these these patches throughout the season. And uh, I think for maybe for West Ham, it's just come right at the start. Um, conversely, I think we can say the same about Arsenal. I think Arsenal, I, I'm i probably a bit pessimistic about Arsenal's chances of the uh, Premier League uh, title race. I think I think they're probably going for a bit of a hot streak early on in the season. Um, I don't think they have the the stamina to to sort of out Man City, Man City throughout the season because Man City squads are so much bigger and it's, they're so, so much more uh, impressive than Arsenal. I just think they're going through a bit of a hot streak at the start of the season. Um, so we'll see. We'll see with Arsenal, but I think they will uh, slow down a bit. Yeah, I think you're right. I think they'll be in with a very good shout of top four this season, but it won't yes. be a tight race. I, I still look at Arsenal. I think if they played at the Etihad, they could still easily get 6 0. Like, that's just the type of like Liverpool wouldn't turn up to the Etihad and get 6 0, but yeah. Arsenal probably would. I, I think that's the thing that's what we're dealing with. I think the, the early indications we can get from Arsenal is I'm not sure we can sort of point towards the title race. I think we can just say they are very, very solid top four contenders, and I think they will end up there in the end of the season. But, um, I think the title race is probably a bit too far. I mean, yeah, second. I mean, with the way Liverpool are going, they could they could make second. I mean, Tottenham. Um, we'll see. But Liverpool again, like West Ham, they might have started a bit slowly. The lower warm up. It's only seven games in. You can't read too much, and maybe give it another five or six games, and then we can really see how the teams are shaping up. Yeah, I think you're spot on. <laughs> um, I think we've covered a lot there, mate. Um, yeah. I'm yeah very happy with this uh, for a first episode. Um, if you guys enjoyed it, definitely make sure to uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Like the video, definitely, because Nick and I would obviously really appreciate it. It would give us a lot of incentive to uh, release the next one as fast as possible for you guys. Um, yeah, we hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you next time. See you later.